Hello, I'm Steve Gillen, historian for the History Channel. The tragic death of President John F. Kennedy 40 years ago is one of the greatest mysteries in American history. In other programs, we have presented numerous theories about the people and events surrounding the assassination. Many of those scenarios, including a mafia cover-up, CIA involvement, and a possible Cuban connection, have been presented in our series, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. This episode, The Guilty Men, examines yet another theory, that President Lyndon Johnson was involved. I know as attorney for Lyndon Johnson that he murdered John Kennedy. He murdered John Kennedy to become president and to avoid prison. And there is no doubt in my mind. You can't kill the president of the United States unless the next president, the head of the FBI, and the head of the Secret Service are in on the cover-up. I'd like the entire world to know how I personally feel is the fact Lyndon Johnson knew about the assassination and was a part of it. Deep in the heart of Texas lie buried some of the darkest and most well-kept secrets that tell us who killed John F. Kennedy in Dallas on November 22, 1963, and why. Those forces of darkness revolved around one of that state's most famous political sons, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Born in 1908, he grew up in a comfortable middle-class home in Johnson City. At an early age, Lyndon showed a keen interest in politics. From the beginning, he was driven by a determination to win, whatever the cost. In a word, he was ruthless. There wasn't anything he wouldn't do to get what he wanted, regardless of what it was. And probably the best example would be in 1948 when he was running for the Senate. And he was running against a man named Coke Stevenson. And the election was very, very close, a very small number of votes, which forced a, a recount. And once they did the recount, they found out a 201 vote error in a little place called Alice, Texas. And eventually they found out that the 201 votes had been added. One for Stevenson, 200 for LBJ. As a result, he won by 87 votes, and he was nicknamed Landslide Linden. But the real name, the name used in the back wards that didn't appear in the newspapers, was Lion Linden. And that stuck with him the rest of his life. That rigged ballot became the template for a political career based on bribery and corruption. The full extent of Johnson's criminal activity only began to unravel 11 years after his death. In 1984, at this courthouse in Franklin, Texas, a former Johnson business associate, Billy Celestes, appeared before a grand jury. According to Billy Celestes, there were eight murders perpetrated on the part of Lyndon Johnson. The first name was a man named Douglas Kenza. That was followed by a number of men involved in Estes' businesses who were corrupt. And they were all killed with carbon monoxide. Josepha Johnson's name is listed on this Justice Department document. That's Lyndon Johnson's sister. So Estes is accusing the Vice President of the United States of murdering his own sister. And the eighth name listed is the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. And then there is a promise of knowing more. And if Billy Celestes is telling the truth, and there is every reason to believe he is, it gives you an idea of the depth of the corruption and the ruthlessness of Lyndon Johnson. According to Estes' written testimony, that murderous cycle began in 1951 in Austin, Texas, at this downtown golf course known as Butler's Pitch and Putt. The killer was a Johnson henchman called Malcolm Wallace. Malcolm Wallace was born and raised in Texas. He was Texas-bred, Texas-educated, a very uh, intelligent man. And uh, when he graduated from uh, the University of Texas, he was evidently recruited by Lyndon Johnson, and he was given a job at the Federal Department of Agriculture. John Douglas Kinzer, the golf pro at Butler's Pitch and Putt, was having an affair with Wallace's wife and with Lyndon Johnson's sister. Lyndon Johnson's sister, Josepha, was an alcoholic. She was a drug user. She was sexually promiscuous. She had loose lips. And who knows what she might tell Kinzer or others about Lyndon Johnson's political shenanigans. 
Malcolm Wallace walked into the pitch and putt golf course in Austin, Texas, and was shot to death in cold blood, John Douglas Kinzer. Kinzer died here for his indiscretions. Wallace was soon arrested and went on trial in Austin three months later. First degree murder, open and shut case. He gets a lawyer, known as a Lyndon Johnson lawyer. So Lyndon Johnson is going to do his best to get his friend out of hot water. During that trial, Lyndon Johnson took a room at a local hotel. And the 10 days that that trial was uh, going, constantly sent runners from the hotel to the courthouse to bring him word of what was going on during the trial. So he followed the pulse of the trial very, very carefully. Malcolm Wallace is found guilty of first degree murder, but through influence of Lyndon Johnson, Malcolm Wallace receives a five year suspended sentence. Lyndon Johnson was able to get his man out of first degree murder. Much of the control Johnson exercised was acquired through an early alliance with a fellow Texan. Edward Clark gained unrivaled power in the late 1930s with a series of high positions in the state government. He became Johnson's lawyer and a formidable ally throughout his career. The power Edward Clark exercised covered almost every avenue of government power in the state of Texas. He would make sure that important appointments were covered by his men. Uh, the judge's control was through their vote. I mean, he had their decision in the palm of his hand. And this was, of course, important because Austin was the capital of the state. And anything that happened legally uh, went through Austin, and that meant it went through Clark. He was known as the secret boss of Texas. He could and did arrange for people to be killed. Um, he arranged for money to be laundered. He had that control. This building in downtown Austin became the headquarters of Edward Clark's all-powerful law firm. Barr McClellan was recruited as a young lawyer in 1966, three years after the assassination, unaware of the dark secrets hidden within. Soon after joining, in an after-hours conversation with John Coates, one of the firm's attorneys, Barr was made privy to an astonishing piece of information. Coates and I started talking, and in the course of it, John told me, if the truth be told, Clark arranged the assassination of Kennedy. It was a kind of statement that you can't easily forget even though I personally chose not to believe it at the time, it stick with me. Attorneys know they're acting behind a privilege. They can say things to each other. And this talk would go on uh, at after hours drinks, at Christmas parties, uh, just traveling on the road. And it was like Johnson had to get Kennedy out of the way. I worked closely with Don Thomas, and Thomas was the business attorney to the president and was the second man in the law firm. Thomas and I did a number of cases together, and we traveled the state because he did not fly. We'd been to Dallas one day shortly after I became partner, and it was driving back. And just out of the blue, it seems now, looking back, that Thomas said, I am the only living man who knows what happened in box 13. And we know what that meant. That was the stolen 1948 election. I didn't say anything. Sometimes it's best just to listen. And then he looked away and added, but Clark took care of things in Dallas. At that point, what I'd been hearing in the law firm, what John Coates had first told me, I knew it was true, because this came from a man that was Johnson's business attorney, one of Johnson's most trusted confidants, a man who worked very closely with Johnson during his maturing years, his, his uh, growing up years, so to speak, and as president. And when I heard that, there was no question but that Clark 
had been behind the assassination, and he'd done it. Poor Johnson. I know beyond a reasonable doubt that Johnson murdered Kennedy. He acted through Clark. He saw that it was done, and he did it out of a corruption of power that is unequaled in our history. You've been watching The Men Who Killed Kennedy, The Guilty Men, a program which presents just one of the many theories about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. After becoming a senator in 1948, Johnson developed an unrivaled power base in Washington using his forceful personality, political skills, and corruption. He established himself as one of the most influential men in the nation, but as vice president to Kennedy, he lost much of that authority. By 1961, his past was catching up with him. In Texas, Henry Marshall, a local agricultural official, had begun investigating one of Johnson's illegal sources of funding. Working out of these offices in Bryan, Texas, Marshall had become aware of Billy Solesti's misappropriation of federal cotton allotment funds. Attempts to buy off Marshall had failed, and his investigations were beginning to threaten the vice president himself. Billy Celestes became worried, Lyndon Johnson became worried, and some of them got together and decided, what are we going to do with Henry Marshall? So on one particular day, according to Billy Celestes, Billy Celestes, Cliff Carter, an aide to Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, the Vice President of the United States, and Malcolm Wallace got together. And finally, Lyndon made the statement, get rid of him. On June the 3rd, 1961, Henry Marshall failed to return home. An extensive search was made of the family farm near Franklin, Texas. His only son, Don, was 11 years old at the time and remembers that day well. My uncle found him on the second attempt uh, when he, he went out uh, to the place. He was uh, in a very remote location, probably about three quarters of a mile off the road. My mother had this stone placed here uh, in order to, to mark the spot. The truck had blood around the sides of it. Uh, the uh, side on the, on the passenger side had a dent in the fender behind the passenger door, and that's apparently where my father's head was uh, knocked into the side of the truck, and uh, he had his eye damaged at that point. Uh, there were a number of yopon bushes that had been broken, and, and the gun was laying beside the body, and pretty much nothing else uh, could be seen except signs of a struggle. Local officials immediately ruled it a suicide, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. He had been shot five times with a bolt-action rifle. He had enough carbon monoxide in his lungs to cause him to pass out at the time he died. Uh, there was no effort made to collect any evidence or preserve the, the crime scene. They had pretty much determined in their minds and that this was going to be a suicide. When Billy Saul Estes testified before the grand jury in Franklin, uh, he implicated Cliff Carter and Malcolm Wallace as the people that were most involved in my father's murder. Uh, Wallace being the trigger man and Cliff Carter uh, being the one who arranged for the uh, murder. I'm firmly convinced that uh, Malcolm Wallace uh, uh, was the, the killer of my father. Who that would have aided, uh, probably uh, political power behind everything, Johnson would have been aided more than anyone else. The grand jury concluded Henry Marshall in 1961 was murdered, which means in simple language that the grand jury believed Billy Solestes when he told them that Lyndon Johnson had ordered Malcolm Wallace to kill Henry Marshall. But Johnson's dark dealings were not confined to Texas. In late summer 1963, one of his long-term partners in crime was about to be exposed for corruption by a Senate investigation. Bobby Baker was the secretary to the Senate majority. Basically, he was the secretary for the Senate. And he was one of Lyndon Johnson's closest associates and everything that Lyndon Johnson wanted to perpetrate, 
he had Bobby's help. Essentially, if somebody wanted to get a military contract and they wanted influence of Lyndon Johnson to help them, they had to pay off Bobby Baker, who would then pay off Lyndon Johnson. It's the world of bribes. Bobby Baker was involved in a call girl service. He was involved in real estate schemes. He was involved in dealings with organized crime. He was in dealings with oil men, particularly Clint Murkison, an oil millionaire from Texas. So as a result of all this, Bobby Baker was in big trouble. And uh, with a little bit of inspiration on the part of the Kennedys, if they could get Bobby Baker to talk, Lyndon was all done. Lyndon Baines Johnson, if Robert Kennedy had his way, would not only not be on the 1964 ticket as the vice presidential candidate, but he would go to jail for the corruption that he was involved with. Although Johnson faced political extinction at the hands of the Kennedys, he had powerful allies with their own agendas that threatened the president, as researcher Gregory Burnham explains. People would think that he had no enemies. He was so popular. He smiled. He appeared happy. Everyone loved him worldwide. But what people don't seem to understand is behind the scenes, he was making changes, and he was making them decisively, and he was taking some very, very daring steps. He was committed to pull out of Vietnam. By October he had signed a document, an SAM 263, to that effect. A thousand troops home by Christmas, and all personnel out of Vietnam by 1965. But that wasn't very good for the military-industrial complex. His abolishing the Central Intelligence Agency, pulling their teeth holding them to task, back to why they were originally created by Truman. Their original mandate by law is only to coordinate intelligence, not to create the Bay of Pigs. NSAM 55 told the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the CIA no longer can do that, and any military operation has to come directly from them to the president, period. That kind of a document really causes problems. But Texas was home to Kennedy's most dangerous opponents. Oil millionaires and billionaires in Texas were petrified of one major factor that John F. Kennedy was considering, cutting the oil depletion allowance. And there was no way they were going to allow that. Essentially, they would save billions of dollars if it stays as it is. It was called a 27.5% oil depletion allowance. John Kennedy thought it was too liberal. One of the key men in this case is Clint Murkison. Clint Murkison is an oil millionaire, owned 500 companies, but he was primarily an oil millionaire. He also controlled Texas, controlled Johnson. His major means of operating and controlling people and influencing people was a little hotel called the Hotel Del Charo in La Jolla, California. It cost a hundred dollars a day in the 50s and at that hotel he would invite all these powerful influential people. Richard Nixon would come there. Key lieutenants of Carlos Marcello, the head of the mafia in New Orleans, used to vacation there. J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, used to vacation there. Free. Every summer for ten summers. Free. Another Johnson man with close ties to Murkison was a wealthy Texan called D.H. Byrd. D.H. Byrd was an underboss for Murkison. He was a Del Charo regular. He owned the Texas School Book Depository. He also founded the Civil Air Patrol, which was a kind of military organization, and Lee Harvey Oswald was a member of the Civil Air Patrol. Another associate of Murkison at the time is Bobby Baker. Bobby Baker's in trouble with the scandals and he was in all kinds of business deals with Murkison and many of them were illegal. So Murkison was concerned that Baker and that corruption would lead to his door and maybe not only would Baker go to jail and Lyndon go to jail but maybe Murkison would go to jail. As the forces hostile to Kennedy grew in strength and number they began to think the unthinkable assassination. Finally a new imperative forced their hand Lyndon Johnson was in big trouble. The Bobby Baker scandal and the Billy Celeste scandal could destroy Lyndon Johnson's career. 
Lyndon Johnson would go to jail. And he was their man. He represented all these right-wing forces. There was an urgency to kill President Kennedy. They had to save Lyndon Johnson. The governor of Texas, first of all, is Lyndon Johnson's best friend in history. They, they went back decades together. In the 1948 vote scandal, John Connolly was every much a part of that cover-up that took place. He was his campaign manager. It is without question John Connolly who entices John F. Kennedy to Texas. Once they get him there, then they're in control of everything. The motorcade routes, the evidence, the Dallas police, everything. It's their land. It's their territory. Lyndon Johnson and his Texas cronies suckered President Kennedy to Texas. The late Madeleine Brown gained a unique insight into Johnson's role in Kennedy's assassination. She first met LBJ in 1948 at the Adolphus Hotel in downtown Dallas when he was celebrating his election to the Senate following the infamous Box 13 scandal. I went, I was very young and it was, it was wonderful. Uh, our relationship developed immediately. Lyndon gave another campaign party in Austin. It was three weeks after I met him at the Adolphus <clears throat> and it was scheduled at the Driscoll Hotel. And, oh, it was so great to see him. I mean, for three weeks I had thought about him and, and how wonderful it was. We were dancing that night and he says, uh, I'll see you upstairs. And he put a key in my hand. I still have that key. <laughs> uh, it was exciting. I felt naughty, but I felt good. I fell deeply in love with him. Yes, I did. I was just the other woman in his life, and uh, my emotions are still the same for him as they were when I met him as a very young girl, but I'll always love him. He was the father of my son, Stephen. That intimate relationship with Johnson continued for many years. Through him, she became familiar with the closed world of power politics in Texas. On the eve of Kennedy's assassination, she attended a party at this house in North Dallas, the family home of oil billionaire Clint Murkison Sr. There was an extraordinary guest list that night. We had uh, H.O. Hunt, Murchison, Lyndon Johnson made an appearance. We had Hoover, we had Richard Nixon. Uh, they were the most influential people there. But I was under the impression that since Jagger Hoover was there, that it was to honor Hoover rather than anything else. When Lyndon came in, no one was expecting him. So when Lyndon arrived at Clint Murchison's, they all went into a conference room. And you could just feel the, the atmosphere. And when Lyndon came out, uh, I was, of course, happy to see him. I did not know that he was going to be there. And he whispered in my ear at that time, those blank-de-blank -blank, uh, Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise. So he departed. The party rapidly broke up after Lyndon uh, departed. A seamstress and companion, May Newman, provides confirmation that this party took place at the Murkison family home on the eve of the assassination. She lived and worked in another Murkison house in Dallas for Virginia, Clint Sr.'s second wife. She speaks here for the first time. I started working for Virginia Murkison in 1962 until her death in 1997, approximately 36 years. I remember well the night before the assassination. I worked with a uh, man called Jewel Pfeiffer, black man, which was uh, Virginia Murchison's chauffeur. He got a call from her stepson, John, at the big house. They were having a big party for a very special guest that was coming from Washington to go to the party by the name of Bulldog, which I found out later was J. Edgar Hoover. And, um, he said he was very excited about doing this, going on this trip out to the airport to take this special guest to a very special party, big party. And I asked him when he came back if he got a good tip 
And he said no, and he was very, very upset. He had to go back that night to take J. Edgar Hoover to the airport to go back to Washington. And he still didn't get a tip. Further verification of Hoover's presence in Dallas on the eve of the assassination came from a friend of May's who worked at the Murkison family home. Beulah May Holman, she was the cook at John and Loopy's house, and she wanted me to go help her that night, which I didn't, but I knew she was, she told me she was cooking quail, and I wanted the recipe, so she gave it to me. She said uh, there was a very important guest by the name of J. Edgar Hoover that was coming, and I should, I should go out and help her so I could get to meet him. If it was a film star, I probably would have gone, but I didn't know who he was. No, not at that time. Early the next morning, only a few hours before the assassination, Madeline received a phone call from Johnson, who was back in Fort Worth with Kennedy. Lyndon called me from the Texas Hotel, and he was still irate. I said, Lyndon, about last night, and he went to cursing. He, he used foul language all the time, and he said, those Kennedys, he repeated, they will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise. And I'd like the entire world to know how I personally feel is the fact Lyndon Johnson knew about the assassination and was a part of it. Dallas was to become forever linked with the murder of the president. But the rich and powerful men who had met in secret the night before had everything to gain from his death. LBJ was fearful of a long prison sentence, J. Edgar Hoover of losing his job, and the oil men of losing millions of dollars. When the shots rang out on Elm Street the next day, those problems were solved. The shock of Kennedy's assassination and its brutality reverberated around the world, but not everyone was grieving. The mood in the Murchison family home was very joyous and happy for a whole week after, like champagne and caviar flew every day of the week. But I was the only one in that household at the time that uh, felt any grief for his assassination. After the president's murder, Hoover had absolute control of the cover-up. All the physical evidence relating to the crime was swiftly removed to Washington. From the beginning, Oswald was promoted as the lone nut assassin. But in LBJ's home state, tongues were wagging. I met Lyndon on New Year's Eve at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin. And the people in Dallas, I mean, everyone was talking about Lyndon Johnson was the cause of the assassination, and it made my heart very heavy. I just couldn't believe that he could be a part of something so, so bad. So I confronted Lyndon. I said, Lyndon, you've got to tell me, were you part of the assassination? And of course, he had a high temper fit, uh, hit the wall, and, and he was very irate and angry. And he said, no, I was not, but the oil pe or he called them he, the fat cats of Texas that I knew, and the intelligence was the cause of the assassination. I am sure Lyndon did not make the plans per se, but he had the key people that he could call to actually do it. If the head of the FBI and the head of the Secret Service and key lieutenants of those two figures are involved in covering up, plus the President of the United States and all his cronies. You don't need a massive conspiracy to get away with this. After the assassination, Cliff Carter, Johnson's aide, made repeated calls from the White House to the district attorney in Dallas, Henry Wade. He was instructed to look no further than Oswald for the guilty man. There was no conspiracy. A similar call was made to the Attorney General of Texas, Wagoner Carr. Then we have Lyndon Johnson himself calling the chief of homicide, Will Fritz, who's really doing the dirt work as far as interrogating Oswald and trying to get to the bottom of this case. He calls him and tells him, you have your man. You have your man. Let it go at that. Lyndon Johnson is trying to control what is going on with the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy from Washington, D.C., with, with crucial figures in the case. 
the late Dr. Charles Crenshaw experienced the new president's controlling hand. He was in the operating theater at Parkland Hospital with his colleagues, working to save Oswald's life after Jack Ruby had shot him. He was urgently called to the phone in an adjoining office. I picked up the phone and it was there I heard this voice like thunder that stated, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. And he asked, how is the accused assassin doing? I was so uh, startled. The thing that I could say was he's holding his own. He's lost a large amount of blood. He said, would you take a message to the chief operating surgeon? It was more of an order than a question. So I said, yes, sir. He said, there is a man in the room. I would like for him to take a death bed confession and all of a sudden the phone uh, went off uh, I returned to the operating room I tapped Dr. Shires on the shoulder he looked at me like what are you talking about everyone was working feverishly in the abdomen trying to correct the wounds there I said guess who I've been talking to I said the president of the United States called and wants that man over there to take a deathbed confession. And Shires looked at me like uh, I was crazy, and we both realized that there was no way Lee Harvey Oswald, had he survived, would have been able to give any testimony until two or three days after the procedure. But still in all, the president had called, and I did relay the message. When Dr. Crenshaw published his story in 1992, he suffered an avalanche of criticism. It was argued that Johnson made no such call. Crenshaw's critics were proved wrong by a former chief switchboard operator at Parkland Hospital, Phyllis Bartlett. The call came in and said, uh, hold the line for the president. And for a second, I couldn't, you know, I was still thinking Kennedy and I didn't, I was, kind of taken back for a minute and then I, in a few seconds, it was just a matter of a second that he came on in a loud voice. He said, this is Lyndon Johnson, connect me to the accused assassin's doctor. It sounded the same as it had been on newscasts when I would hear him speak. I knew I had put a call to the operating room, so I contacted Dr. Crenshaw and I told him, I said, I, that I knew he did get the call and that I was sorry that the people had, in the newspaper and on the TVs, had tried to discredit him. And that was when I spoke out. From the moment he became president, Johnson had authority over every aspect of the cover-up of Kennedy's murder. He was unassailable. Johnson has the power to contain the investigation, both nationally and locally, on the ground in Texas. More so than if it had happened, let's say, in Oregon or Wisconsin, Texas. Uh, he's got the power to give the CIA what it wants as president, as opposed to Kennedy, who they feared. He's got the power to take the National Security Action Memorandum that Kennedy had signed in November 1963, tear it up, reverse it, and create a war where three million soldiers wound up going to Vietnam instead of 16,000 being brought home by JFK. He can make J. Edgar Hoover director of the FBI for life. He's the man in the middle. The only person that can answer all of the questions of who's at risk, Who's going to gain the most? Who wins in this deal? There's only one answer to that question, and that's Lyndon Johnson. And his ticket out was Elm Street. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence linking Johnson with the assassination is through his henchman, Malcolm Wallace, the convicted killer of Douglas Kinzer. In the hours following the assassination, on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building by the southeast corner window, the Dallas police discovered an unidentified fingerprint. The fingerprint, the fingerprint, is the ultimate part of the Mac Wallace story. 
the FBI fingerprinted every Texas School Book Depository employee, including women employees that worked downstairs, never handled the boxes. They fingerprinted every Dallas officer that was in the sniper's nest so that they could remove those fingerprints from consideration. At the end of the day, you have one fingerprint remaining. It sits in the National Archives for 35 years, until 1998. An investigator takes it to a highly qualified, certain, certified latent print examiner, a CLPE, along with a redacted fingerprint card from Mac Wallace from the 1951 murder of John Douglas Kinzer. And he said, here's a print, here's a print card. Do you see anything? Nathan Darby is one of the most experienced fingerprint experts in the United States, with 35 years service in the U.S. military and the city of Austin Police Department. I didn't know where it came from, and oh, a week or ten days later, I called the party and that had brought it over and said, well, it's a match. The finger that made the ink print also made the latent, and we called that a match or identified. And there was no question about it. it, it they matched. Three years later, Nathan Darby readdressed the same evidence and reconfirmed his original findings. When he was done, he had a 34-point match. And when you mention that in criminal circles to an investigator, how, how confident would you feel with a 34-point match? Oh, that's a slam dunk. It can't miss. It doesn't get any better than that. You, you give me a 34-point match on any case in the United States, I'll take it to court and win. The inked and the latent print are made by the same finger. And the other evidence that, that I've been presented with was Malcolm Wallace's left little finger without a reasonable doubt. Now, the fingerprint in question came from a cardboard box in the sniper's nest in Texas School Book Depository. Fingerprints do not last long on cardboard. So it's fair to say that either Malcolm Wallace was wandering around there for no purpose, or he was in that sniper's nest on November 22nd. That evidence, that fingerprint evidence, along with Malcolm Wallace's sordid resume, was sent to every imaginable agency or individual that could have an interest in what happened to John Kennedy. The only people that took notice of it were the Dallas police because it's still an open homicide on their, on their blotter. And they took serious notice of it. And then they were told, forward it up the line because Dallas no longer has any evidence. It's all in federal hands, even though it's an unsolved homicide. They forwarded it up the line. And it took 18 months, 18 months for the FBI to say verbally, no, it's not a match and the single most important fingerprint found in the last 35 years was buried. I don't know why they couldn't say that, or say that the thing you know, didn't match. It did match. There's no question about it. I, 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 my experience, I've just had too much experience. I know what I'm talking about. I'm positive. No question about it. My dying declaration, if I was to drop dead right now, they match. It's still the big lie. It's unknown. It's unidentified. No, it's identified. It's Malcolm Wallace, and he's linked to Estes, Carter, and Lyndon B. Johnson, directly. According to the official record, Malcolm Wallace died in a single car accident on this lonely stretch of Texas highway on the night of January 7, 1971. There were no witnesses. His body was taken to a local hospital where he was pronounced dead. He was buried here, close to other family members. Eight months later, another key member of LBJ's inner circle, presidential aide Cliff Carter, died unexpectedly. But shortly before his death, he met with Billy Solestes. They discuss all these murders that Cliff Carter is knowledgeable about. Now, Billy knows about some of them, but Cliff knows about more, and he fills them in on all the details. Malcolm Wallace being a central figure in most of these murders. And there were over 17 murders that Carter tells Estes about. And he actually tells Estes that he fears for his own life. And within two days' time, he's dead. Johnson's attorney, Edward Clark, was one person who prospered. 
But when LBJ was brought low by the Vietnam War and decided not to run for a second term, Clark felt shortchanged for his role in the assassination, according to his legal partner, Barr McClellan. He expected eight million dollars spread over eight years over the two terms Johnson was to serve. When those terms were cut short by Johnson's sudden and ex unexpected resignation, Clark was four million short. He was not a man to be denied. When he had done a service, he was going to be paid. Planning ahead, he went to Big Oil and Big D, went to Clint Murkison to say, look, I've done you all a great service. I deserve more. I'm going to get it. Murkison agreed with him and suggested he file for a well in the middle of the great East Texas oil field. He called me in as his personal attorney to make the first bid for getting that money. And he was not successful in getting four million, but he got his two million. So when all was said and done, Clark realized six million dollars for the assassination of John Kennedy. Bar McClellan believes documentary proof of these dark deeds lies in the Johnson Clark legal records. For many years, they were kept in a high security area above the Clark offices, known as the penthouse. Any of us attorneys could get into the general area, but the secret area, the Johnson area, was locked off, accessible to no one. I have a strong belief that there are substantial records somewhere that show this conspiracy and its both evolution, its execution, and its cover-up. But I don't know where they'd be. We need to see them. Johnson was ultimately consumed by the high office he had so unscrupulously striven for. A broken man, he retreated to his Texas ranch, where his lawyers were to secretly summon a psychiatrist to deal with his deepening depression. An immediate concern at the law firm was that he would say too much. The million dollars was available to the psychiatrist to keep anything from coming out. The one reason for all these protections was the greatest demon that was dogging Johnson at the time, and that was the assassination of John Kennedy and the role he played in it. We had to keep it covered up and for sure we had to keep the psychiatrist muzzled, and we did. But if any one set of records needs to be produced, the psychiatric records should be disclosed to the American public, because they will, I am confident, disclose his role in the assassination. Only four years after leaving office, Johnson died. But there are those living who are still afraid to come forward to tell what they know about the guilty men. People are afraid of him dead. He's been dead since 1973, and his shadow still casts fear in this country, especially in Texas. Undaunted, across the nation, the questioning voice of the American people will not be silenced. An overwhelming majority refused to accept their government's version of what happened in Dallas on November the 22nd, 1963. There's no statute of limitations on murder. If they're still continuing to cover it up in 20 more years, that's obstruction of justice. It's a conspiracy. The men who kill Kennedy don't end with the people who pulled triggers. It should be important to all of us that we get to the bottom of this. Just as John Kennedy's car took an incredible turn when it went on to Elm Street, 300 feet later, our form of government, our way of life, our way of respecting our government, our way of being respected by our government, took that same kind of bizarre wide turn. And we haven't gotten back on the straight and narrow yet. The Kennedy assassination was the end of faith in government. And so it's up to the little man to fight the odds. Davy Crockett, Sisyphus pushing his rock. Someone has to keep fighting the odds. And even though you know the chances are that you're never going to get a resolution to what you're fighting for, you have to fight for it anyway. Just the principle of justice. Just the principles of American democracy. Don't give up. Keep fighting. This episode has presented one viewpoint. 
We have also presented many other theories in numerous programs. For the History Channel, I'm Steve Gillen.